Welcome to the Pulsed Field Ablation, PFA, Summit. Today, we will focus on the scientific theory, clinical evidence, and early practice of PFA technology in Europe and Hong Kong. We will have the privilege of hearing from some of the world's leading cardiologists and electrophysiologists, who will share their invaluable experiences and expert knowledge on pulsed field ablation. Our speakers will be presenting lectures and leading a live case on pulsed field ablation, giving us a unique opportunity to witness this innovative technique in action. This educational webinar for Asian cardiologists was chaired by the president of Hong Kong InPACE, Dr. Johnny Ho Chun Yuan, the president of EHRA of ESC, Professor Jose Marino of the La Paz University in Madrid, Spain, and the director of Wuhan Asia General Hospital, Professor Sushi. Welcome uh, to this uh, Pulse Field Ablation Summit. My name is Jose Luis uh, Merino. I am the current uh, ERA president from the European Society of Cardiology. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to this uh, fantastic uh, event organized uh, by uh, different partners, including the Hong Kong Heart Center, the Hong Kong uh, uh, Hospital Network, and the Asian Pacific Structural Heart Disease Club, uh, sponsored by uh, Boston Scientific. We have a very interesting mor morning here in, in Europe, but uh, afternoon probably there, with uh, some live cases and some uh, interesting talks. And I really uh, congratulate the course directors, Dr. Lam, Dr. Yuan, and Dr. Fung for this, for putting together this interesting po uh, program. So I would like to hand over to my uh, uh, other uh, co-chairs in this session before going to the next, uh, to the first live case. So, Professor uh, Susie, maybe you can start with uh, the first uh, the introduction of the uh, Dr. Chupak Lu, uh, Lau, can you please uh, yes. start introducing the, Hello. the first session? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, da, 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 那么我是来自香港亚洲医疗集团难点应用批准应用临床但是国内现在目前有十多家厂家正在进行这方面相关的器械的研发那么在我们中心也有完成了前期的器械的临床实验国际上或者是国内同行得到的结果是一致的那么一个是手术时间会更短第二个是它的安全性会更好那么消融的结果可以和射频消融或者冷冻消融是相同的或者相当的所以说这是一个值得大家关注的一项技术那么也非常高兴
And uh, Professor Lau and dear colleagues, um, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Zhang Li Yun from uh, Hong Kong, Hong Kong in Pace Society. Uh, on behalf of Hong Kong in Pace, uh, it is our great pleasure to collaborate with uh, ESC, uh, Hong Kong Asia Heart Center, and Asia Pacific Structural Heart Disease Club to organize this uh, PFA summit. Uh, PFA uh, is a very hot topic in uh, AF ablation because uh, uh, it is very effective and safe and it is going to have great impact in uh, clinical practice in uh, AF ablation. Uh, we, we are very honored today to have uh, experienced operators from Hong Kong Asia Heart Center, Dr. Y.Y. Lam and Dr. Jeffrey Fung uh, to show us uh, live cases. And we are also very honored to have uh, distinguished speakers from uh, different parts of the world to share their experience on PFA. Now, let's take a look at the live case from Hong Kong Asian Heart Center, performed by Dr. Yat Yin Lam from Hong Kong Asian Heart Center, and Dr. Jeffrey Fung from Hong Kong Adventist Hospital. Hello, Hi. everyone. Hi. Hello. Bye bye. Can you hear Jeffrey. Us? Hi. So, uh, I'm Dr. Lam from Hong Kong Asia Heart Center, and today we are very honored to have the opportunity to show two live cases. Uh, using this new PFA technology for treatment of patients having paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So I'm Dr. Lam, uh, the director of Hong Kong Asia Heart Center, and Dr. Jeffrey Fong, uh, who is a very distinguished uh, EP physician, uh, is uh, doing the case uh, with me. And this is our scrub nurse, Iris, and we have the Boston uh, technical team supporting the case. Maybe I introduce the first case. So this is a 70-year-old man at history of dyslipidemia, post-hepatic neuralgia, uh, fibrotic lung disease, uh, follow-up Kowloon Hospital. Uh, he also had coronary artery disease with stenting uh, about one month ago and already completed one month of triple therapy. Now it's on NOAC and aspirin. Uh, he also had atrial flutter, and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation for onset of two years. And these are um, his medications. Um, so echo showed um, at that time uh, in atrial flutter, uh, mild moderate uh, by atrial enlargement, moderate TR. And the plan today is to do the atrial flutter ablation and also PVI with PFA. And for the interest of time, we already uh, completed the uh, atrial flutter ablation. So I will hand on to Jeffrey Fong yes. about the latest progress of this patient. I think uh, an hour ago, we have just started doing the uh, flutter ablation. We confirm it is a CTI-dependent atrial flutter with the clock rise uh, rotations. And uh, we did a linear ablation from the tricuspid valve to IVC, and we saw in the termination of the flutter. And then we keep on ablating, and then we achieve a bidirectional block across the CTI. So the patient is now back to sinus rhythm. And uh, we, uh, in the interest of time, we have done the transeptal puncture under TEE guide, and we've done the LA angiogram. And maybe we can show the angiogram to see the, uh, the, the panelist's opinion. Can you show the angiogram on the screen? And make the screen bigger. That's right. Uh, we are we are checking for the, this one. This is the one looking at the left superior pulmonary vein, and the size is around thirty. Can we measure the size? Yeah, it's around thirty. It's around thirty. And then, uh, um, can we show the right side? This is the right upper pulmonary vein, and uh, also on the RAO view, you can see the right uh, lower pulmonary veins. So um, about uh, any comment about uh, using what size of the PFA to this case? Any opinion from uh, all the experts? Uh, so Jeffrey, uh, uh, very good case. But uh, uh, may I ask, uh, do you routinely do uh, pre uh, procedural CT uh, for? Uh, I think so. You maybe Dr. Lam will know better. Well, uh, the, the role of doing pre-procedural CT uh, in the old days, maybe you can exclude the airway from this and you can actually look at the anatomy of pulmonary veins. There are cases, although very rare, with uh, multiple pulmonary veins, more than four. Uh, but I think in this case, uh, in this technology, I must say the role of 
free procedural CT is not really uh, uh, compulsory, right? So, yeah. Because we are more relied on uh, the angiogram uh, to identify where is the ostium of these pulmonary veins. And also because there are only two sizes available, the 31 millimeter and 35 millimeters. Most of the time we are more relied on impression. Of course, we can use a mark pectel and various to physically measure the, the diameter of the ores and select according to it. But I think in, in around 80 to 90% of the cases, we tend to use a smaller, smaller uh, system, 31 millimeter. And you, do you do people see CTs? <laughs> we don't. Uh, it, mainly it's just because of the, uh, you know, the resources implication rather than yeah. uh, we, we, we like to have it, but uh, we don't really, uh, you know, practicing this. Uh, and how would you select 31 or 35? Also, as you mentioned, kind of by impression as well. So uh, uh, just like this one, looking at this one, this is pretty big uh, left side of vein, right? So. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you probably at least we need a 35, right? Mm. Yes, Do you agree? We, I mean, we already <laughs> chose, chosen that one already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> May I ask? Any uh, different opinions uh, from the audience? Yes, so, uh, this is uh, CP from the uh, moderator. Uh, may I I'm ask why why and uh, Jeffrey, this is a great case. May I ask uh, two things? One is, do you have a pre-op echocardiogram as an assessment of the left atrial size that may help? And secondly, uh, I just wonder, are you doing general anesthesia uh, in this case uh, after the TEE? Yes, we will have a pre-op echo, of course, uh, just to make sure there's no valvular heart disease. And also measure the left atrial size, as you mentioned, is around 4.5 in this case. And uh, usually we can do this procedure under sedation or under GA, but uh, we usually prefer to to be done under GA. We have some experiences because during PFA is actually quite painful and the patient still move uh, if you just give sedation. I think if resources allowed uh, for patient comfort, uh, maybe GA is a better option. But I would say sedation is also a reasonable choice. Thank you. We just have uh, Dr. Uh, Aoyang Feifan here. So, uh, uh, Aoyang, how are you? Uh, we have uh, Joseph and myself here. We are moderating uh, the sessions. Uh, My name is Lade. Uh, CP, nice to see you. Hello, hello, Aoyang. Hello. You look great. <laughs> Yo, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just, just to briefly recap what we have discussed. So this is a patient with uh, atrial flutter and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. We already completed the CTI uh, ablation, and now we are going to do the PF, PVI for PAF. And because of very large uh, pulmonary vein uh, angiogram uh, findings, we decided to use a 35 uh, ferrowave wave uh, system. So maybe the audience will be interested to look at the ferrowave. wave. Can you zoom closer? I can give you a course so I can show you the background. So you see here, I can actually change uh, the configuration of the cavity. So from initial, this is more coin-like to a basket. And then I can also change it to a flower configuration like this. So you can see that from the flower configuration, there are five petals. And within each petal, there are four electrodes. Uh, usually the first electrodes, uh, you can also record the pulmonary vein uh, potential uh, from that electrode. So to do this procedure, you see uh, the tip, we will use a small curve, a uh, stiff wire that actually help to position uh, the wire in the pulmonary vein and help track this uh, system to the pulmonary vein. And the small tip actually helps if there's a strict tip, uh, you may have a risk of pulmonary vein perforation. And to do this procedure, normally you have to first um, go with a basket configuration like this and put it in the ostium of the uh, pulmonary vein. And then you will give uh, each vein, you need eight cycles. Uh, each cycle lasts for 2.5 seconds. Uh, for 
Ostium first, you do um, in one configuration like this, uh, 2.5 seconds for two therapy, and then you rotate. But it's very like a myth. They said like 36 degrees. I found it is really a myth. You just empirically turn, and then they change configuration, and then you give another two cycles. After that, you pull back it to the um, ostium, uh, back to the entrum and then you put it into the flower configuration and then push against the wall and then you give another two cycles and then you turn it and then give another two cycles. So most of the time you will have uh, isolation seen during the first cycle therapy. So, um, so you can always ask questions as we are uh, doing the procedure. So um, for the setup of the procedure, you can see the groin. We have two venous axes. One is uh, for the introducing of this ferro drive sheet. It is an uh, inner sheath 13.8 uh, millimeter system. And outer sheath is uh, uh, three millimeter larger, so 16.8. Uh, I like this sheet because uh, it's transparent in this part. So in case you have any air while you exchange the catheter, you can identify it closely and then you can suck out the air. And and also we have another venous access or so putting in a CS catheter. Um, that's usually we will have a backup uh, pacing because sometimes during the procedure, the patient, especially when you ablate the left side pulmonary vein, there will be a very strong vagus stimulation. The patient can go into a systole. Um, I know in a Europe, uh, in some centers, they, they tend to pre, uh, give patients atropine before ablation. This might avoid additional um, venous puncture to put up a backup pacing. I think in private, we, we still are at the early learning curve. So we want everything to be full gear just to ensure uh, we don't go into any problem. All right. Okay. So let's go to the left upper. Yeah, let's do the left upper, uh, right upper first. Oh, right upper, okay. okay. So, uh, Jeffrey, any reason that you want to target the right upper first? Or? Because the cabinet just at the opening. <laughs> 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 no reason. So, so because we, we, when we do the TEE and we intentionally put a, do a puncture more anteriorly, mm -hmm. And once this uh, shift going to the left atrium without turning, they're just directing to the right upper. Yeah. That's why we do the right upper first. No special reason. Yeah, that's very good. A uh, very important tip. Um, for most of the uh, intervention procedure on the left side, we tend to puncture posterior. Uh, for this, maybe slightly anterior puncture. Yeah, because we want to leave some room for going to the right lower. Yeah, right lower. If it's too posterior, then there's a problem accessing the uh, the right lower primary vein. So we do this uh, under TE guidance. Okay. So, uh, so are you doing like anterior and more superior? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, okay. Jeffy, just a uh, point. When you do quiet ablation, you normally go to the uh, left side first because uh, because uh, you just don't want uh, in case of diuretic issue uh, yeah. to uh, so that you can actually uh, interfere with the left side ablation. Is is that what you are doing as well? Um. I don't have much experience about the cryo ablations, but I think, uh, yeah, Professor Lau, you're right. Sometimes we try to avoid these uh, situations. But for the this one, I think uh, we don't, we do encounter phantom nerve stimulation, but we don't worry too much about phantom nerve palsy. Yeah. So I think we can do freely to do the ablation without any other uh, special maneuver. Agree. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, can we make the electrogram bigger? Why are you doing right. that? Uh, you know, uh, why, why, you know, looking at the angiogram, there seems to be a middle vein uh, on the right side. So, uh, mm -hmm. what is your plan for that middle vein? Um, yeah, I, I think we try to use the, the bigger size uh, basket, try to cover the middle. But we try to then later to see any signal after the first ablation attempt. If there's a residual signal, we will do the ablation over the middle point. Okay. Is that what you are doing in a piece of wells? Joseph? Sorry, yeah, I, 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 I would do the same. Yeah, I agree. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's put it into the right upper. So you see, Dr. Fung now is putting a basket against the ostium. 
So look at the electrogram, you can see clearly. Um, uh, so the upper three channels are surface ECG, and then you have a CS catheter signals. Uh, the, and the lower and the yellowish are the pulmonary vein signals. Do we need to check the pacer? So now we will usually put the CS catheter in the RV just for backup. But usually we have problem while we are playing the left side of vein. Right side of vein usually is not a problem. Why do you still use a CS catheter or you just go in with a single shot uh, venous puncture without the backup pacing leads? I, I, I always have a backup pacing. Uh, okay. But now we tend to use more atropine, as you mentioned. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So now I think we are ready for the first therapy. Can we uh, zoom the panel? So let them see the panel. So uh, this is a baseline uh, yetropine by the EFA catheter. And uh, we are ready for clearly. Um, uh, so the upper three channels are uh, surface ECG, and then you have a uh, CS catheter signals. Uh, the and the lower and the yellowish are the uh, pulmonary vein signals. Do we need to check the pacer? So now we will usually put the CS catheter in the RV just for backup. But usually we have problem while we are playing the left side of vein. Right side of vein usually is not a problem. Why do you still use a CS catheter or you just go in with a single shot uh, venous puncture without the backup pacing yes, leads? I, I, I always have a backup pacing. Uh, okay. But now we tend to use more atropine, as you mentioned. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So now I think we are ready for the first therapy. Can we uh, zoom the panel? So let them see the panel. So uh, this is a baseline uh, yetropine picked up by the EFA catheter, and uh, we are ready for delivery. Yeah, yeah. can you okay. zoom here? Yeah, zoom here. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. Okay. okay. This is a chance to cover the uh, middle vein, but uh, those check the echogram, uh, the yetrogram later. Okay. I got shiver jaw cells here. So we can see the panel. So uh, to do this therapy, just uh, first you have to choose the uh, voltage. It's by default two, right? That's a commercial secret. I don't know why it's two. And you already touch the system. So the system says it's ready. So you just press confirm and then okay. deliver the energy. Again. It's okay. deliver. Okay. Is it so see, after the first uh, ablation, the, the PV signal actually disappeared. Okay. So we did have a second one. Second one. Okay, okay we okay, can so rotate we can... the catheter. I usually use the wire uh, and then decide how to rotate. So because there are actually five pedals. So now you, you have two on the right side, three on the uh, left side. So I think that's, uh, that's the way we tell. Okay. Should yeah, we, we can start another side. ablation. Okay. Okay. Ablation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we already completed four cycles of basket. Now we're going to do a flower configuration. So to ensure better contact of this uh, flower, you see Dr. Fong usually push up the delivery sheath so it has um, better um, contact with the uh, ostium. So you want all to go down. Maybe you want to check out RAO as well, LAO as well. So you don't want one to any of these paddles to go into the pulmonary vein. I think that looks nice. Yeah. 
Dạ, chuẩn bị á. Ok, play. Ok, another, another go. Turn. So usually we pull pull back the the flower a little bit, we turn and then advance again. We are ready for another go. So we are done uh, for the wrap. Uh, let's go to the other vein. So which vein you want to go? Uh, right lower. Right lower, okay. Any comments on the um, panel and the moderator? Mm. Did you see any like, that very nerve, nerve capture? Do you not know? in this case. Not, not in this case. case. Okay. But uh, we have encountered the uh, fairy nerve stimulation in other cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes the ablation cavity jump inside the right upper from the vein. And the system will tell us to stop them when yeah. these are too, too close together. So, uh, but it's, it's no better. Mm. Can you show us some tips how to go to the left, uh, right lower? That's usually the most difficult vein to go into. Uh, yes. I will try the flower shape first. If not, then I would uh, pull the temperature back inside the shift and then just uh, manipulate and rotate the shift directly to the right lower. And, and this one may not be it's very difficult because the atrium is very big. Okay. That's from no. Okay. All right, I'm gonna check the PV signal here. How do I team? So we'll monitor the ACT during the procedure, and hopefully if the ACT is more than 300, that would be good. Okay, we are ready for first. Okay, it's gone. It's all. After time. Okay. I'll try it. Okay. Okay. What my say though? Oh, 
And I'm doing a lot of structural procedures, but I must say this uh, really makes uh, me want to learn about this procedure. It's relatively simple and it's short. And the safety data is really um, amazing. So you don't have to worry about pulmonary vein stenosis, fistula formation, running nerve palsy, et cetera. I think the most common reported complications in the studies are vascular complications. So that's why I think in our lab, we all use ultrasound guided femoral vein puncture. Yeah. Maybe while we are on the right side, I will see whether you can cannulate the right the middle branch. Okay. May I ask uh, why, why and Jeffrey, uh, do you ever use contrast uh, medium uh, at all? Uh, I also particularly for the yeah. in the I basket see. position. Uh, would uh, uh, how do you make sure this is sitting right close to the ost or the ostium of the uh, vein? Mm. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your comment. I think for the cryo ablations, uh, I think you have to have very close contact with the ostium. And you usually use contrast, make sure the vein has been sealed off. Otherwise, the pie ablation may not be delivered very effectively. For PFA, I think maybe we don't need uh, such a high degree of close contact because the PFA is the concept is mainly about passing a high voltage current across the cell layer to, to create a torus. So uh, it may not be required to have very close contact. Uh, of course, there's certain contact, but not as tight as the uh, choir balloon. That's uh, what we know so far. So normally, we don't use that uh, contrast to locate the precise location. And it seems that so far, that without using this less tight approach, we still can achieve the, the PV isolation. Yeah. And because you are forming a basket with a uh, deep, smaller, and the basket, the, the middle part is uh, wider, you push it in, you feel a little bit of resistance. So uh, like here, if I push it in, you have a bit of resistance that you know uh, more time, most of the time it is in the ostium. Yeah, about uh, Joseph's concern about the middle vein, we now have to see the catheter around the opening of the right the middle vein. We can see the yeah, yellow, no signal. we don't see any signal. No signal. Probably the attempt over the right superior TV has also covered the middle portion. So we, we don't intend to deliver anything around the middle vein. But even though you, you deliver, it doesn't really matter. Right? Uh, uh, yes, but uh, for EP doctor, uh, no signal, that means you wish to not do anything. That's right. Okay. All right, let's go to but, the... Uh, uh, Are there any comment from Joseph? No, I, I totally agree. Uh, but uh, will you do kind of an exit block uh, by pacing? Do you process? normally do the exit block? Well, I, I, I tend to do it now, I think, yeah. With this, you know, the, the procedure is so short, I mean, uh, my story, okay. yeah. You use this uh, capital or use a special the like last capital? The, uh, just use the uh, far wave capital. So. Okay, we can do it in the maybe the right uh, upper, okay? Because the size is uh, okay. bigger on the right. Okay. okay. Oh. That's the lap leper one. You might want to withdraw. Well, they lie how the basket. I'm going to with Okay. Okay. Oh, Thomas, I thought I'd say. So I think we are deep inside the right part of the vein. Can we do it to a higher put thing? Very nice. Okay, I don't yeah, think there's yeah, any, nice. any exit, uh, exit problem. Okay. okay, so uh, we turn off the pacing first. And then we go to the left side. Okay. I turn out to you to hold it. Okay. 
Yeah, I think it's the uh, baseline. I like uh, AOU and RAO because sometimes uh, there's a few chances can go into the appendage. So we're using LAO, you see the wire coming out of the hot channel is quite reassuring. And uh, normally when we deliver over the left side, we'll pay attention about the vagal response. Yeah. So we have the pacing standby, and then uh, we're about to deliver. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think it's the the baseline. I like uh, AWO and AWO because sometimes uh, there's few chances can go into the appendage. So we're using LAO, you see the wire coming out of the hot channel is quite reassuring. And uh, normally when we deliver over the left side, we'll pay attention about the vagal response. Yeah. So we have the pacing standby, and then uh, we're about to deliver now. Okay. Pace. Pace. You see the ABC there, sir. Yeah. Okay. okay. Stop the facing, please. Okay. Okay, and then we deliver again. Hey, sir. Uh, no need to recover. Okay. We try to reshape the, um, the, the task because the two electro has been too close together. Mm. And uh, when they're too close, we cannot deliver the PFA. Okay, pull back. Okay, better. Okay. This one is uh, better. And then we can try again. Good. You can also see that all the PV. Okay. Yeah. It's still, still seeing a, 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 because the two are too close together. So this is an important Try. concept, right? So uh, if the two, uh, the spines are too close together, they have risk of uh, short circuiting. So uh, now it's, the machine will uh, now it's fine. We just open it back together. Okay. No, it's still not very good. It's not in the Austin. You have to go in. It seems the two of the spine is still. Yeah. Uh, How long you still find joy, joy, joy? Mm. Okay. 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 Okay
You want to take it out and just examine the uh, okay. system okay. outside the body? We'll take it out. Yeah. Okay. Hold your wife. Um, how you make a aspirin? Right. Yeah, we're not going to keep your wife. We're not going to keep your wife. What's up? Your wife is not going to keep your wife. Yeah, you keep your wife. Yeah, you keep your wife. Yeah, you keep your wife. I have to examine the health of Okay. Okay. Oh, so okay. You go back again. Okay. Very busy. What? So, you got IPC range on. Okay. 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 I see. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time. Right? First time. This is this is live yeah. uh, demonstration thing. I think. Yeah. So we try to go in. Again. Okay. Let's see. Okay. okay. Here's. Stick together. Could it be the this one's too big for level upper? You think? Maybe thirty one is better. Oh, you know can more? you can try to do the flower position first. I think they they allow to do that right now, right? So yeah. Do yes, the yes, flower yes. first and then. Yeah, that's a very good suggestion. Uh, wise. Sometimes for right lower. Uh, the first position, nice position, is that you come with a flower shape and then you clockwise rotate your sheath and that flower is in the ostium. So you can do flower first. Okay. That's good. Okay. Why is in your case, have you encountered any coronary spasm during PFA? Uh, I mean, we, we still keep, the, I mean, we still do it, just do the primary vein isolation. So I, uh, coronary spasm probably is not a major issue. We, we haven't mm. used the PFA for, you know, out of the box indication like oh, age of okay. flutter. Have which, you tried to play up with the posterior wall? I haven't tried that yet. PPR <laughs> did Maybe just okay. wait for right? Just let wait for what? That makes you age of pain. Hmm. Hey, like you're missing. Yeah, I made you age of pain. 
But I know a lot of people are doing uh, posterior wall uh, ablation with yeah. PFA nowadays. So. Yeah, because uh, the posterior wall is a critical area, especially for those uh, persistent yeah. cases. But is it really helpful? I mean, you you can do a more durable uh, PVI. Yes, because in the past, we were hesitant about the risk of the HO esophageal fistula. Oh, I see. So uh, we are using a lower power, and somebody would use a temperature probe to avoid overheating the esophagus. But for PFA, um, they don't have such a complication, so we can do freely. So uh, that is, I think, one of the benefits of the PFA when we are going to the posterior wall or the left atrium. Still, there's a exit port for the wire. That wire, if you push it really hard, will you perforate the... Uh, maybe uh, the Professor Aoyuan can give us some idea. Maybe you have tried it before. Yeah. Hello, Aoyuan. Have you used this system to uh, ablate the posterior wall? As we should. But it needs in all centers. Maybe Boris can add some uh, information. I don't know. Is Frankfurt use the same technique for possible possible wall isolation? Well, in the humble law. Okay. And I do know it is easy. It's not too difficult to isolate possible wall. Okay. But we we never try or in other over centers. Yeah. We have we have C2 cases. We have two C2 cases. In both two cases, okay, one from Frankfurt, one from Hamburg. Right. We put the PFA at okay. the right okay. line and induce cold artery spasms. Mm. We only see two cases. Oh, but what's the mechanism? The right upper pulmonary vein and coronary artery are far, far we, away. We don't, we don't know detail, exact detail. I think so maybe some, so maybe to so gang the GP uh, in maybe. Okay. Yeah, we use the biggest size uh, basket to uh, capture the uh, top of the vein as well, mm. to avoid the, the, the two spines getting too close together. Okay. So I think in exam, if you have S elevation during this procedure, yeah. the most likely cause is air embolism rather than yeah. coronary artery spasm. So this is very important to make sure uh, when you introduce the system, the catheter, uh, the whole system is uh, free of air. So uh, just how, some housekeeping uh, announcement. So uh, there will be a mic uh, available. So any if uh, any of the audience, uh, especially uh, here in Cordes, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can. Uh, uh, they, there will be a mic available for you to ask the questions. So. Please go, please do not hesitate if you have any questions. Okay, okay so I think we have finished the, um, the left upper pulmonary vein. And you can see from the electrogram, there's uh, nothing there now. Mm. So we also do the exit football as well. Next, we invite Dr. Bradley Willsmore from the University of Newcastle in Australia to give a talk on the science and clinical evidence of PFA. Enjoyed watching that highly skilled operators. It's a pleasure to be here. It really is an honor. Um, I'll just go through some of the science and clinical evidence behind PFA, uh, starting with my disclosures that some of the issues and topics and catheters here are investigational. They may not be available wherever you are. 
Um, and I have received some very small amounts of funding from all of the companies. Nothing, I think, relates directly to this. Uh, I do use um, Boston Scientific's catheter uh, currently, and I was part of the trial for Medtronic's catheter for PFA. Um, we'll go through that in a minute. So firstly, just to start with the science, it is interesting to know that it started back in 2007, and I have the publication here where they used it during surgery, and they, in fact, gave um, some surgical ablations uh, to pigs where they were able to cause very good lesions. And this was, you know, it's taken almost 16 years to develop from this to where we are now. And uh, interestingly, their conclusion said that the catheter was swift, precise, transmural and no local heating. And to be honest, I think we are currently back to that almost exact stage. So in terms of how they actually work, in the past obviously used thermal energy, heating and cooling. The problem with that is that it's indiscriminate. When you heat the tissue, everything in vicinity is also heated, similar with cooling. So there's the potential risk for damage to uh, the phrenic nerve, the uh, aorta, the esophagus, the lung, and uh, in particular pulmonary vein stenosis is something that we've been worried about in the past. PFA works via non-thermal. Uh, mechanisms. And so PFA actually induces apoptosis through irreversible electroporation. So an electrical field is sent out. It changes the pores in the myocardial cells, which allows the exchange of different electrolytes and substances through those pores, which causes non-thermal death of those myocardial cells. So as you can see on the image on the left, when we would normally isolate the pulmonary veins, the esophagus, phrenic nerve are in close proximity using PFA. It's very tissue selective and there's, and I'll go through some of the evidence about if there are any actual impacts on the esophagus, phrenic nerve or other non-cardiomyocyte kind of damage. It is also important to understand that pulse field ablation is different for everybody. And I'm going to go through some of the catheters and the designs and the studies, which is really, I find quite interesting. Um, but it is important to understand that they're all very different. And so it's reasonable to expect the results from the different catheters and trials will also be different. And on the left there, we are trying to compare apples to oranges. If you think about some of the variables, number one, first and foremost, the catheter design. There are very different catheter designs, and I'll show you some of that, which all have different electrodes, electrode counts, numbers, spacing, size, geometry. And so that can really impact the, uh, the procedure itself. Then you have the actual pulsed field ablation, the frequency, the duration, the count, the number, the amplitude, the polarity. They can all vary in. There has been some progression of this over time in some of the studies. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then there's the patient, the proximity, the catheter, how it sits. Does it fit in the patient? Where does it go? What's the contact like? Um, cell size orientation. And so it's important to keep some of those things in mind when we're trying to look at different catheters um, throughout the process. So in terms of clinical evidence, uh, in particular outcomes and safety. So I'm going to go through all of these things. This is just a very brief overview summary slide. And so Boston really have led the way here with their catheter, which was just used in that excellent example prior to this. Um, and they went through three kind of iterations, impulse, PEFCAT and PEFCAT2. They have had 121 patients enrolled in their clinical trial, but over time they've evolved and the final waveform was used in 49. It is a little bigger. It's a 12 French catheter, 13 French sheet. Um, it's over the wire and 31 to 35 millimeter catheter diameter. So they come in two different sizes as was just discussed in the prior case as well and has 20 poles. Um, Medtronic, uh, have been really second to market almost. And so Medtronic's trial, their initial trial was in 2021, just a, a safety trial, 38 patients where they showed 
Um, they had a very high 100% acute success with zero complications and then went on to a much larger trial, 300 patients, half paroxysmal, half persistent, followed for a year. Um, the Medtronic catheter is smaller. It's a nine French catheter, 10 French sheet. It's also over the wire, but it's 25 millimetres, so smaller than um, Boston's. It has only nine poles compared to the 20 of the Boston catheter. So very different catheter, and we'll go through some of the results of the different trials there. And then there are a whole bunch of others, and these are not available in many places. They're all essentially investigational, but coming very close to approval. Sphere 9, which is via Thera, now purchased by Medtronic, you see there um, is the nitinal basket type catheter. Um, Biosense have a trial in Spire, which we published just this year. You can see their catheter has 10 poles, variable size. Abbott have a 14 pole catheter with variable size. And then there are some others, Hangzhou and CathRx, uh, still in early phases, but certainly a, a wealth of catheters in progress. So, firstly, to dive a little deeper into some of the results. Boston Scientific, firstly, their catheter, um, which you've seen beautifully in that just prior example. And importantly here that it, it has two different shapes. It can be put into a flower shape as seen there on the left or the basket shape, which is seen there in figure A. When looking at the clinical trials for this catheter, procedural times were around an hour and a half, 90 minutes. Some of that is to do with the electroanatomical map mapping as part of clinical trial as a standard wait time and there's often some mapping pre and post and we're all very excited by these catheters. I know I certainly was and when we got access to it, we were very keen to map and look around and see how things were going. And so since that trial has finished and we've been doing, using this catheter, uh, I can assure you that the ablation procedural times are much quicker than these clinical trials. And so in terms of acute efficacy, and you'll see this essentially across all of the catheters, acutely there's 100% success. It's very easy, I would say, relative to RF to get electrical isolation of the pulmonary veins acutely. And it's almost always done on the first um, pulse, sometimes the second, but typically we'll see the, the vein is completely isolated with the first pulse. And there were no issues with um, PV reconnections during the waiting period. Um, some people have used adenosine, and we did in a few trials ourselves and did not see recurrence. And again, that was mentioned in the prior trial, the, the case study just there, that it's very uncommon to get reconnection. And so uh, waiting time is probably less significant here than it has been with RF. Safety on the right there, you can see that it is a very safe catheter. Um, two perforations, um, tamponade and one vascular complication, which important to note is not catheter specific, obviously. It's not to do with PFA, to do with the transeptals and the vascular access. But importantly, we want to know the, the outcomes and the one-year outcome for the entire cohort of 121 patients was 81% free of AF. But the freedom of arrhythmia when you looked at the optimised waveform, which was in a lower number, but freedom from any atrial arrhythmias was up to 85%. So very consistent with other trials from radiofrequency and cryoablation. In terms of safety, um, this has been one of the key features of PFA for sure. And so when you look through the safety here, um, in terms of esophageal damage, essentially none. And I think we've all come to learn over all the clinical trials and certainly me sitting down reviewing all these clinical trials again, um, there's no thermal damage. You're not going to get any esophageal damage here. And so you can see a beautiful image there of the left atrium, which is lit up at its surface with a very comprehensive ablation of the left atrium. And there's no enhancement on MR of the esophagus. And so image C there on the left, the yellow arrows are the esophagus, the white um, points are the left atrium. And on the right image D, you can see the ablation highlighted with the white arrows and 
the esophagus there in yellow is completely unaffected. In terms of the phrenic nerve, gyroscopy at the end has not shown any damage. It is interesting that you can capture the phrenic nerve when you come on for impulses, but in no way has it been damaged and persisted in any way, shape or form. Pulmonary vein stenosis, you see here from a, a figure on the right with RF, even in the best hands, you do get some pulmonary vein stenosis, often mild and less than 50%, not symptomatic unless you're going and checking. You may not know, but some of it can be severe, 1%. With PFA, there's been zero. It's been a big issue, the concern about asymptomatic cerebral emboli or silent cerebral emboli. And so as part of this trial, a number of patients uh, had MRIs pre and post, and there was only really one with a subclinical enhancement on MRI. And again, I would say that tends to be, sorry, go back there, that tends to be uh, not particularly catheter specific and, and much more likely to be to do with sheath sheath management and um, small air emboli going in and out with catheter exchanges are much less to do with the actual um, ablation PFA technology. And it's very consistent, if not better, than RF trials. And it was mentioned just there uh, in that prior trial as well, which is great linking to the, <laughs> this talk, is that there's also a study with this catheter in persistent atrial fibrillation, 25 patients. Um, and they showed, again, acute 100% uh, success rate has been consistent across all of them. And interestingly, in this trial, and you can see the figure up there to the right, pulmonary vein isolation was done in the typical manner, but then the posterior wall was ablated. And you can see there with the flower catheter, it is very easy to get posterior wall isolation without that risk of esophageal heating or damage. And then the third image there in the top right corner for flutter, you can see... Um, that the flutter ablation uh, is also quite quick and effective. And when all three of those approaches were done, the success rate here was up to um, 92% at 12 months or just short and 24 of 25 off medication. So really profoundly effective here and does differ to some of the prior trials with persistent atrial fibrillation and uh, the suggestion that extra pulmonary ablation hasn't been effective in the past, maybe to do with the way we do it and the technique and safety and efficacy. So, and in this trial, again, consistent findings, one perforation, very low rates, nothing specifically catheter related. I will draw your attention to lesion durability, number two there on the bottom left. And what I do want to show is that the ablation time for the pulmonary veins when this trial was 22 minutes. Um, for the posterior wall isolation, it was 10 minutes on average. And for the CTI line, nine minutes. And so very small additional time, an extra 20 minutes to get the posterior wall and do a flutter line. And so to summarize the Boston Scientific's catheter, it's, it's 12 French, 13 sheet, uh, has 20 poles, comes in two sizes. The trial was done across three centers with five operators very vigorous follow-up for these patients. So weekly trans telephonic transmissions or whenever they had symptoms plus halters. And the results were 100% acute excess with remapping at 93 days. Durability was very high at 84%, a little lower when they hadn't yet optimised their catheter. There were three adverse events, not specifically catheter related, and 85% freedom with the optimised waveform. So now we'll move on to Medtronics and they've called theirs Pulse Select. And so the catheter design, as I mentioned earlier, is certainly different. It is bipolar, biphasic and tailored vectoring. Uh, the catheter size, not as big as Boston's. Uh, it's over the wire, has its own generator and the sheath and catheter are a little smaller. See it here sitting in the pulmonary vein, and on the left image there, you can see that it's not quite a circumferential lesion. So you rotate the catheter after a lesion to get full circumferential lesions. On the right there, you can see a very nice antral kind of ablation of the pulmonary veins. I think we'd all be happy with that post radiofrequency ablation. 
And so the two trials uh, from Medtronic, the first was in 2021, and it was just 38 patients, paroxysmal and persistent, just followed for 30 days, showing a very high success rate, acute, 100%, no adverse events. The second and much larger trial, which has just been released, the pivotal trial, um, was with 300 patients, 150 paroxysmal, 150 persistent, followed for a year. They also had, like Boston, weekly trans telephonic transmissions or when you had symptoms plus ECGs and halters. Slightly different to Boston's trial, this was across 41 centres, nine countries, 67 different operators, 61 of which had not used the system before. And the results, to jump straight to the punchline, in paroxysmal AF, 12 months, freedom from arrhythmia, 66%. Persistent AF, 55%. Primary safety endpoint, it was very safe. Only one patient in either the paroxysmal or persistent. However, there were some non-ablation-related issues. There were two deaths, one from liver cancer, completely unrelated, in a patient with some cirrhosis, and one with an arrhythmia on defetilide. Um, and so there was also 9% silent lesions on an MRI, which has been about consistent across most of the trial. Sphere 9, and I suspect this is probably going to be the next catheter on the market, but I would hate to predict, um, being acquired by Medtronic, and this is a 9 millimole, millimeter nitinol. A catheter, a very different design to the other catheters and what we're used to. Uh, it has nine temperature sen sensors and can do RF and pulsed field ablation. It has a, its clinical trial just recently published as well. The original trial was a small subset coming from the later trial. Um, so it's a smaller French, 7.5 French catheter. Uh, interestingly, in the first trial, they also did the mitral isthmus. And when you look at that, the average time was 5.1 minutes. And as somebody who's spent many hours trying to ablate mitral isthmus lines and challenging patients to be able to do it in five minutes is, is phenomenal. But again, consistent across most of these PFA catheters. Two minutes for the roof and two minutes for a CTI line. So you know, certainly a very quick procedure here. Uh, similar to the prior studies, one adverse event due to vascular access. The bigger trial just published recently, 178 patients, 70 paroxysmal, 108 persistent. They did remap 122, um, but again, they also evolved the technology over the trial and the number with the final optimised waveform was 55. And in those 55 patients, the success in paroxysmal, 78 persistent, 85%. So that's with the optimised ways form. So very low risk, very high success, or at least equivalent to RF for success rate. Biosense, Biosense Cardo um, have, a, have their own catheter that you can see there. It's a variable diameter 10-pole catheter. Um, their initial trial in 2021, the full trial just this year, it's all happening this year for the bigger trials coming out and 226 patients, uh, but very few have had the 12-month follow-up paroxysmal patients, 12 applications of AIM, 13 centres, and freedom of AF again around that 80% of 12 months. They certainly did learn along the way and there were some silent lesions in four of six of the first six. So some changes were made in particular, a 10 second pause between ablations. And after that, it was a very low rate and again, somewhat consistent with the other trial. Abbott, Abbott have their catheter, which you can see there just Next to it, it's also a variable diameter lasso-shaped catheter. It's 14 poles. Um, their initial trial is just on 10 patients. I suspect their follow-up trials are much closer. Um, but in that, they had a very high acute success, don't have long-term outcomes yet. And then two that are more in development. And just to show you really that whilst the bigger companies have um, progressed more quickly. There are some other competitors, certainly in the wings, CathRx being one of them, and they have an abstract, and there's certainly some enthusiasm for the catheter. Um, 
has a slightly different design and we don't have the images, you know, pet, but uh, I'm sure that won't be too far away. Um, but as was mentioned in the prior study, I think there are some actual PFA-specific issues to discuss, and most of the trials to date have been looking at what's consistent with RF-associated issues, complication, adverse events like phrenic nerve damage, esophageal heating, but haven't been the case with PFA. But what is of particular interest is coronary artery spasm. And so coronary artery spasm has occurred in a few patients and um, a, a very nice publication from uh, Vivac Reddy, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, showed that during CTI with um, Boston's catheter, there was no spasm during ablation of the veins or posterior wall. But when they did the CT line, CTI lines, cavotracuspidismus line, um, all five patients had some coronary spasm that was relieved by GTN. There's some beautiful images there on the right from the paper showing that when you're down on that CTI, you really right are right over the raw coronary artery. Uh, it's a pulse of electrical activity which seems to be stimulating vasospasm in that artery. But very nicely showed that with pretreatment of a nitrate, there was no significant coronary spasm. So not approved, off-label, don't recommend it, all of those caveats. But in that trial where they pretreated with either intracoronary in five patients or intravenous in 10, none had spasm. And uh, I just love that image there, image C, where you can see the um, tricuspid valve labelled it down there at the bottom, um, the IVC up there at the top, and the PFA catheter sitting there covering almost the entire isthmus. And you can see why the CTI ablation times from, you know, anywhere from two to 10 minutes uh, have been shown. It's very impressive. And the other issue is really vagal stimulation. And in that prior trial, I think there was some vagal stimulation there as well. Once again, it doesn't appear to damage the vagus nerve, doesn't appear to damage the phrenic nerve, but it does appear to stimulate it. And so vagal um, responses have been very common to the fact that it's often recommended and we have been pre-treating patients with atropine to reduce those vagal responses. Uh, I thought I would just show this slide because I think it's it's where we're heading, that PFA is the future of electrophysiology. Again, and I've written there at the top and the bottom and everywhere, this is not approved, not appropriate, investigational only, but there was a case study published for a PVC ablation, and so they've put this catheter up into the RVOT in a patient with frequent PVCs. First ablation, it went away, no more PVCs, and... Uh, I think it's going to be exciting times to be doing electrophysiology. And so to just summar summarise in the last slide across all the trials, that acute success rates very high and essentially 100%. Freedom from arrhythmias, depending on the catheter and the type of atrial fibrillation, anywhere from 50 to 85%. And I would say very comparable to radiofrequency. Procedural times, fluoroscopy exposure, generally shorter, but again, the clinical trials are not necessarily representative of real-world stuff where you're waiting for 20 minutes and you might be mapping pre and post. Safety profile is where I think PFA really exceeds. It's got a very favourable safety profile, low rates of major complications, almost zero-related device PFA-specific complications. Um, but there are some ongoing non-device related issues and, uh, and I think it hasn't made AF free of, of issues and complications. You've still got the transeptals, the vascular access and these cerebral events that continue to occur to some degree. So much, much better, a huge step forward. Uh, off record for me, I love this technology and look forward to only using PFA forevermore for our AF ablations when it's available. And that's it from me if there are any questions. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wilsmoff. This is an excellent coverage of the topic. Unfortunately, we are running a little bit short of time. I just want uh, your thoughts about uh, a, the 
design of the cavities. One is a basket guided, allowing you to do inside the pulmonary vein. The other is basically a circular cavity that you use primarily outside on the osteum. Uh, do you think these have uh, uh, differences in the, uh, in the thought thinking about ablation? Yeah, I think both, uh, even the Boston catheter wouldn't recommend ablation inside the vein. I think when we do use the basket, we probably get some inside vein ablation. But, um, you know, here with PFA, contact not so important, proximity is. And I think we're getting good vein isolation, whether you're inside or outside the vein. The risk of PV stenosis is low or zero. The risk of chronic damage low or zero. So I think we'll be a lot more liberal moving forward about concerns of being maybe a little inside the vein, maybe a little outside. I'm not convinced it's the cause for any difference in success, Frank. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to move on because we have images transmitted from Europe. Thank you very much, Dr. Now, we invite Dr. Boris Schmidt from Cardioangiologisches Centrum Bethanien in Germany to give a talk about the early practice of PFA in Europe. And yeah, that, that, let's go ahead. So these are my disclosures. Um, well, I think one of the most uh, striking publications in my life as an electrophysiologist was this one, Fire and Ice. Uh, I think uh, my friend Fifa Noyang is also part of the authors. Um, and uh, this certainly... Uh, was a big game changer for pulmonary vein isolation uh, as the first single shot device that made our lives much, much easier. So uh, we've gone through this ice age for now, over a decade now. And uh, I think it's time that spring is coming back and we see some flowers. So let's let's see how this technology performs in the in the arena of, of catheter ablation. Um, we have already seen a beautiful life case uh, from uh, from the hospital in Hong Kong. And I think a lot of the, let's say, approaches that we um, suggested were adopted. Uh, so with this catheter, with the PFA catheter from Ferropause or now Boston Scientific, we are aiming at a simple, a safe, a single shot pulmonary vein isolation using sedation only. Uh, depending on the geography where you work. So it's a 5S strategy, and, and this consists of a very simple and very streamlined, streamlined workflow. As you have already seen, single transeptal puncture, uh, some centers perform angiograms, others don't, um, so that it's not mandatory, but it can be helpful um, to place the catheter in the appropriate position. Um, you can perform a mapping and ablation with just a single catheter, as you saw. Um, you usually um, uh, uh, operators choose the four by two recipe. That means uh, two different poses, four pulses. And um, um, again, the remapping, the confirmation of polarization isolation is performed with, with that uh, particular catheter. Um, there has been a discussion during the conference about contact, contact force. Um, I agree with um, the, the, the fact that probably contact force has a very low ceiling effect, meaning that if you go beyond a certain value, you will not get additional benefits. However, I still believe that precise positioning of the device inside or at the pulmonary vein ostium is crucial and mandatory because, the, of course, the penetration depths of the electrical field uh, is limited, is set, that's fixed. And uh, the closer the electrodes are to the target tissue, the better and the deeper and the more contiguous the lesion will be. Uh, so um, unfortunately that's not videos, but we saw during the live case how the operators manipulated the device until the petals of the fair wave catheter um, were visually in contact with tissue. And I think that helps a lot. Uh, uh, to get a good lesion. And the second, be, uh, referring to the previous speaker, is that I, I do believe that if you position the basket, the smaller basket inside the tubular portion of the vein at the very proximal part, that might be beneficial in comparison to catheters that are only covering the antral portion uh, of the vein. And, and um we, I would probably expect that you can get more variability in your catheter towards 
um, towards the individual anatomy. But we will see that in the future. That's just personal opinion. We saw that you can use the catheter for remapping. If you, if you take it into that olive shape and the, let's say, the, 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 um, the correlation with this regular type uh, spiral mapping catheter are very, very high. Other centers tested this even with high density mapping using the pentaspline or the pentaray catheter. Uh, and as you can see on the right hand side, they had 91% congruent findings on PV isolation versus no PV isolation. And um, a, let's say, a vein deemed isolated, but it wasn't isolated when you used the high density mapping catheter, was only 2% failure error rate, which is very, very acceptable. Actually, um, uh, these um, operators in Bern, Switzerland, tested also for exit block. Just one thing, because we also saw during the life case, you need to reduce your output pacing to probably 10 um, um, amps, um, milliamps, because um, the electrical field is, of course, much larger as with the um, uh, uh, regular circular mapping catheter, just to be, be sure, make sure you do that. <clears throat> so now, Let's go into procedural matrix. This is actually uh, uh, our procedure curve from Frankfurt with 509 cases. Um, and you can see uh, the procedure time um, and the fluoroscopy time depicted here. What can we see here? There's hardly any learning curve. There's no true slope in this curve. The average procedure time is 35 plus minus 12 minutes across six or even eight different operators, which is, I think, a spectacular. And if you can look into uh, in detail into the, the blue graph, you can see that some of the cases are even quicker than 20 minutes, which is certainly new to us and very amazing. So uh, if you analyze the learning curve, and this is actually a very interesting uh, analysis here, we calculated, we computed logarithmic fitting models to individual operators from our center. We have here, we have depicted three different operators. And um, it, you can see that the slope of the curve is in the very initial phase is extremely uh, steep. And then it goes uh, to almost a horizontal uh, um, a curve uh, after several cases. And if you want to interpret these cases, you can see, you can look at three different values here. This is A, which is then the average procedure time after the learning curve, 25, 30, 35 minutes for three different operators from our center. You see B, the effect of learning. That means that is more or less the delta. What is your gain, your absolute gain in procedure time? And then C is the most important value, I think. It's the number of procedures it takes to absolve one divided by E, uh, so that means 36% of your learning curve. And you can see it takes only 17, 13, or 20, uh, or here, two cases to go through this process, to uh, to go through 40%, almost 40% of your learning curve. So it's very easily adoptable for different operators. Um, safety is certainly very, very important. If you look at our experience with now having 615 cases performed in our center, you see, we had two pericardial effusions very early on in our learning curve. Um, one was associated with a guide wire, a straight tip guide wire that we don't use anymore. We now use the, the J tip guide wire that you, you saw in the life case. And one was associated with the sheath perforation of the right superior PV, uh, uh, well, operator failure, uh, we, we have to say. Um, two strokes occurred very early on in the validation phase when we still use the lasso catheter, exchanging catheters multiple times through the fair wave. And I think I strongly discourage to do so. And um, uh, since then, we haven't seen a single stroke. Um, there are some trains in phrenic nerve palsies. I will get back to this. And then, of course, vascular access complication associated with any intervention procedure. Um, is it also compatible with implantable electronic devices? It seems so. My friend and fellow colleague, um, Dr. Xiao Ji Chen, uh, published a nice case series in, in JICE uh, late last year 
Uh, and we did not see any um, interference with any type of devices, pacemakers, CRTs, ICDs, with all brands of manufacturing. So it seems to be quite safe to perform PV isolation in carriers of pacemakers and ICDs. So that's why we hypothesize that this technology being so safe, being so easily um, performable, that this will change our approach in the emergency situation, treating patients with atrial fibrillation, seeking help in the ER of your hospital. Um, it is similarly effective or, or similarly safe, I guess, as electrical cardioversion. And that's why we are now performing the so-called E-team study, a pilot study with 200 patients, randomizing these types of patients to either early emergent treatment with PFA pulmonary isolation or to conventional treatment with the endpoint of cardiovascular death, stroke, hospitalization for heart failure or acute coronary syndrome, or the performing uh, the number of electrical cardioversions performed. And we're particularly looking into patients with heart failure with reserved ejection fraction. Um, I said, let's go back to trains in phrenic nerve palsy. You can see here a case of phrenic nerve palsy from our lab, ablation at the right superior PV, you see paradoxical movement of the diaphragm, diaphragm uh, and just afterwards. After a little time, there's um, the recovery of the phrenic nerve function or the diaphragmatic function. And then after another while, it's completely back to normal. And this whole series of images or fluoro videos took six seconds. So if we talk about trains in phrenic nerve palsy, we're really talking about seconds, sometimes few minutes. And um, the animal data suggests that there's no um, damage to the integrity of the phrenic nerve, but it's all functional, a functional electrophysiological phenomenon. There's also a discussion about coronary spasm. This is actually a case from our lab. You see ablation, then you see progressive development of ST segment elevations in the inferior leads, also development of complete AV block, and uh, when we performed the angiogram, we saw a severe spasm of the proximal right coronary artery. No evidence of air embolism actually at that time. And uh, after uh, uh, application of intravascular or intracoronary nitroglycerin, it completely resolved with instantaneously. The, 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 the difference to the data that was also already presented from, from Vivek Reddy referring to the core as a CTI and the right, distal right coronary is that in our example, the distance between the right superior PV and the right proximal right coronary was more than five centimeters. So it seems to be another mechanism of coronary spasm than just um, distance related and field related. Um, we have seen this once in 600 cases, but something that you need to pay attention to. Let's talk about performance, meaning how durable is isolation. So if you look to the left-hand side, in patients that came back to our lab with, repeat, uh, with recurrence of atrial tachyarrhythmias, we mapped the treated veins from the index PFA procedure and saw a 91% durable isolation rate. If you look at different catheter types, you can see that with the smaller, the 31 millimeter device, you even get a 90 seven or 96.6% durable isolation rate. So it seems to be very, very effective. However, we saw a high number of atrial tachycardias in our patients. And many of these atrial tachycardias actually referred or had their critical isthmus at the posterior wall of the left atrium. So-called iatrogenic or man-made atrial tachycardia because with the index ablation, we created a narrow isthmus of surviving myocardium at the posterior wall, at the roof and the posterior wall, um, 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 being, being the source of macro reentrant tachycardia uh, after, after that. So some centers now are performing few applications at the posterior wall to uh, make sure they don't create this type of, uh, of narrow isthmus at the posterior wall. But if you use it, fluoroscopically only, it's difficult to assess how broad your corridor is. Um, let's go into effectiveness uh, or efficacy. 
on the right hand side, you see data from uh, two German centers that summarize their data. They see a 90% arrhythmia free survival for paroxysmal and 60% for persistent. And that matches quite well with our experience, single center data from CCB, 83 versus 64%. Quite encouraging data. Now, our fellow, Dr. Urbanak, he also compared our results with the latest 200 cryobloom cases, so a 400 patient study. And you can see that um, acute isolation with both technologies is, is, is very, very good and very safe. Procedure time is clearly in favor of, um, 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 of, of PFA, reducing by almost 30%. And, oh, I'm sorry, I go back and there's also, yeah. And then uh, if you compare safety data, then this is also in favor of the PFA system. There's no statistically significant difference, but there is numerically fewer complications with PFA, um, uh, uh, no, having no stroke, no esophageal injury, no hypopneumoptosis, and no persistent brain nerve palsy. So um, as I said, maybe Ice Age is getting closer to being over and, and flowers will flourish in the future. Um, in terms of effectiveness, again, no difference was found in our single center retrospective study with a median follow-up of 390 versus 380 days. The, in a mixed population with paroxysmal and, and persistent, effectiveness was 78 to 75%. <laughs> Last thing I wanted to address is the versatility of the device. I think my previous speaker has already shown our nice case from the RVOT, but we have also used it for right atrial tachycardias. This is a case of a young gentleman who has failed two previous RF ablations with an atrial tachycardia from the right atrial appendage. And uh, then he was referred to our center and we ablated with a single shot this, this tachycardia from the RAA using the PFA catheter. Um, we also have a smaller case series of isolation of the persistent left appear vena cava, a very difficult patient population, though small, and uh, by Dr. Tohoku, uh, a fellow from our lab. And uh, this you've seen, and we have also used it in a single case for structural VT with a lady with a large basal uh, uh, aneurysm and uh, uh, two failed RF ablations or two recurrences after uh, ablations and uh, ablation with the PFA instantaneously uh, terminated tachycardia, rendered it non-inducible, and we are still working on the clinical follow-up. And my friend and teacher, Professor Uyang, has uh, contributed another case for this, and this is also under revision. So um, just the last image from our friends in Bern. If you don't need to, if you don't have any restrictions in using any type of catheters, what does this technology do to your everyday work? And um, you see the development of cases in a Swiss high volume center. You see the number of cases increased over the years. Cry Balloon entered the arena in 2018, getting more of the market share. And then 21, they started using PFA that certainly changed the landscape immediately. And now last year, it completely changed their approach to patients with atrial fibrillation, um, almost getting 80% or 70% or of the market share, which is, I think, very impressive and uh, matches my, let's say, prognosis for uh, my global prognosis for our EP community. Um, I invite you to, to join um, uh, a late breaker clinical tri trial um, uh, presentation at HRS, May 20th, 9.30 a.m., uh, summarizing 1,200 patients from our European Real World Outcome Study, the Euporia Registry. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to discuss. Thank you very much, um, Boris Schumit. Uh, yeah, good, uh, good presentation. Uh, now let's open questions. Do you have any question or comments from the audience? So uh, may I ask you a question? So you uh, you mentioned uh, the contact force is uh, are uh, uh, very important. So 
in your feeling, uh, you mean contact flows is mm, just soft attachment or uh, a little strong contact? What do you think, Eva? Yeah. Um, uh, thanks for the question. Um, um, I don't have the 100% answer, but um, from, let's say, there are contact force catheters that are being used with a different type of PFA technology. And I think Hiroshi Nakagawa did nice work on um, on uh, in, in the animal lab with this um, technology. And he clearly showed that there is a um, the relationship to contact force uh, in terms of lesion size and lesion volume, depth mm -hmm. as well as as, as width. And um, it might be different, of course, for, with these single shot type catheters. However, I still think that you need to bring your electrodes as close as possible into contact with the target tissue because mm -hmm. the electrical field is set you, it, it's not depending on your contact force, but the, let's say the reach is fixed and the closer the source of that electrical field is to the tissue that you want to ablate, the more likely it is you get to transmural lesion. Mm. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Hi. Yeah, from Dr. Wills from in Australia. Great presentation, thank you very much. 20, uh, I mean, procedure time is down to 20 minutes. So just sedation, general anesthesia, and that's the whole procedure from needle to skin to catheters out? That is correct. Yes, it's the skin to skin procedure time that we, we pick, depicted here. And, and, and yes, I, I, under, um, I understand we are very lucky in, in our, let's say, uh, in our country that we as cardiologists can perform sedation using propofol only without an anesthetist. test. Um, I, I know that it is different from a legal perspective in many countries, um, but um, yeah, it, it's feasible. So uh, we do a physician-directed, nurse-assisted anesthesia, deep sedation. Uh, patients are breathing spontaneously. And uh, um, uh, we, we haven't changed our approach in comparison to thermal ablation procedures. It's the same approach with very similar doses. Maybe the peak doses are sometimes a little higher for, for the propofol because of the electric, uh, the, the muscular contractions. But of, since the procedure time is so short, the absolute amount of propofol that we're applying is, is similar to, to other cases. Yeah. Um, Dr. Schmidt, um, thank you for your presentation. Very nice talk. I have a question for you about um, PFA and also um, cut implantable device. Um, you have mentioned the paper that um, PFA has nothing to do with any uh, device parameters that is good for us. Uh, for our practice, um, uh, are you still um, uh, switching to non-sensing mode during the procedure? I mean, acutely, there should be some effects on uh, the device or you, you, you even don't need to switch uh, to any particular mode during the procedure? Yeah, yeah, that's all, also a very good question. You saw the tracings that uh, uh, Dr. Chan acquired during the study. And um, so at event, when we started, we, we, also, we, we changed the, um, uh, of course, for defibrillators, we switched off the detection algorithms, et cetera. But I don't think that it's necessary. We don't do it anymore because the time of uh, pulse delivery is so short that it will never um, activate a uh, or, or activate the charging of, of the device. Uh, we also um, uh, leave the pacer in a uh, in the regular pacing mode, um, so it's um, inhibited for two point five seconds. That's true, but um, um, this is a pause that can be tolerated by <laughs> every patient. Uh, so we 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 don't let's say we don't pay attention to the programming of the, of the electrical devices anymore now when we're doing the cases. Uh, just one, let's say maybe command or point of, of caution. We don't know if this holds true for monopolar devices. Um, um, uh, Dr. Wilsmore mentioned the Afera device, which is a monopolar uh, PFA device with a larger electrical field. And I don't know if that is associated with any changes in, in electrical devices, but for the bipolar ferropulse device, we haven't seen any interactions. Lastly, 
we invite Dr. Gary Chinpang Chan from Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong to give a talk about the early practice of PFA in Hong Kong. In addition to discussing the early practice of PFA, he will also share his experiences with PFA and provide valuable information into its use in clinical practice. Uh, invitation and so uh, uh, I hope all of you enjoy this uh, symposium and this new technology definitely changed the paradigm of uh, the AF operation especially in the world and today's uh, I'm going to talk about some early experience in our center um, I think all of you already enjoy in love a lot of uh, operation stuff from previous speaker and also the, um, the live case so I would like to change the focus of uh, PFA so let me show you two cases. This is the first case. It's a 69 years old um, lady with a symptomatic persistent atrial fibrillation for two years. Uh, quite symptomatic with uh, ERA score 3, Trebe score 2, and normal ejection fashion with a pretty large uh, LA. Um, after the uh, detailed discussion with the patient, so the patient is scheduled for the combined AFib operation and also the percutaneous LAO. Um, in our center, we mainly perform the PFA under the GA procedure. Um, we try uh, once with a MAC, but the experience is not that good. And actually, it's quite painful. Uh, the patient movement is quite uh, significant. And to a certain extent, actually, um, it jeopardizes the efficacy and efficiency of the procedure. So now we offer GA uh, procedure for all of our patients. So let's, uh, that's our workflow. So usually we will uh, shoot the LA venogram and you know, for uh, viral pulse, they have uh, two sides. One is a 35 and 31. And, but uh, at the beginning, we try to decide the size of a catheter by the venogram. But now, as we all know, the catheter contact actually is quite important. So we tend to use the larger one. So uh, just like cryo, we use the larger balloon. So now, unless there's a, a contraindication or the catheter is not available, so we try to use the larger catheter. And then we will shoot the right side. And you see this one, actually the vein is pretty large. So we use the 35. For combined procedure, we always, uh, use a TE guide transeptal puncture. If we do the PFA alone, usually we, we did the transeptal under fluoroscopy only. For combined procedure, actually we need the detailed uh, consideration before we choose the site of a transeptal. Because for LAO, actually, it will be better if you get the transeptal at the inferior and posterior area of the LA. But if you puncture two posterior area uh, for PFA, it will be very difficult. So most of the combined procedure, we use the lower and mid position uh, of the uh, interatrial septum. I don't bother you about the procedure detail because you see enough in the live case and also the previous presentation. So we just, you know, as usual, we perform the basket and also the furrow shape operation in different range. And we try to ensure the contact by looking at the movement of uh, the catheter. So this is the typical picture. After one shot, usually eliminate all the signal. And for right side, uh, this case, because the left atrium is large, I, I hope you can appreciate that. Actually, it is not that difficult to make a good shape in the very large left atrium, and it will be pretty easy to ensure the contact. And you can see that, um, especially for the white lower wing, for this case, you can see the very beautiful flower shape in most of the case. But in the very small LA, actually I will show you in the second case, you will find that the right lower wing is the most difficult part. After that, we proceed to the um, LAO, and to answer the question in the previous session, on the left-hand side, this is the ridge before the PFA. On the right-hand side, and I hope you can see that there's a huge and a swelling over the ridge. Can you see the swelling over the tip of the ridge? And this is the proof of you know, the PFA delivery. And you see, um, that's make a little bit uh, problem for the sizing of the LAA. And we choose the sizing 
before the PFA operation because we thought that um, the swelling will, will, will be gone after, you know, uh, uh, maybe one or two months. So I hope you can see that now um, the size of um, this um, um, swelling is around six millimeter. Before that, it's just one millimeter. So definitely there's uh, some effect over the rich area. So for this case, we performed the LAO with a Watchman device. Um, and I hope you can appreciate that by doing the appropriate transeptal, actually uh, it is pretty easy to perform the LAO with a combined procedure. And just like the usual case, we deliver the LAO and everything look good. And this, and actually uh, for most of our case, we rely on the TEE to confirm the deployment. We rarely use the uh, X-ray. So you see that by using this uh, X-print uh, um, imaging, you can clearly see the uh, deployment of the Watchman device and you can see um, you can appropriately put the device in the appropriate position. So after that, um, remember that this patient have a swelling over the ridge and we will um, check the need and also the compassion uh, in different angle. And in this case, you find that um, all the angle and all of them have an appropriate compression and on the, left hand, uh, on the right hand side, you can see that even with the uh, rich um, swelling, uh, still there's uh, no gap. And for this case, actually after three months, sorry that I don't have uh, the, the TE at this moment. And after the, res uh, the resolution of the swelling, actually there's still no peri-vascular de uh, peri device lead. So um, it seems that it's feasible and also uh, is um, uh, applicable to use a combined procedure in this kind of a case. And after three months, so um, we performed the TE, there's no leakage. And then uh, we use a 31 millimeter Watchman Fest device and the patient uh, was uh, in sinus rhythm. Remind you that this patient has a persistent atrial fibrillation for two years. So um, it seems that at least at this moment, it's quite uh, reasonable to expect the good result from the PFA. And the symptom score actually improved significantly. How about the second case? This is a male, uh, 68 years old, with a symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Again, uh, pretty symptomatic with a high ureter score, Chapman score two, and normal ejection fashion. This time, the left atrial volume is not that large. Again, after the discussion, uh, we performed the combined AFib operation and also the LAO implantation. As usual, we performed the venogram, and even with a small LA, you can see that the uh, PV is not that small. So again, for this case, we use a 35 uh, millimeter device. And as usual, um, by using the large device, usually you can ensure the good contact. And even for the basket shape, you can see that uh, you don't need to make the very large basket. And with this shape, it can already have a good contact. And how can we prove the good contact? Actually, we cannot push the basket in the PV. So, you know, you will get the good contact by doing that. Um, as usual, you see uh, after the PFA, usually just one shot, uh, it will eliminate all the electrogram. And then this is again uh, the other picture to show you uh, the shape of the PFA. And so for this one, and you will find the, the difference between the, this case and the previous case. So for the right upper, usually it's okay. You won't encounter any difficulty to make a good shape of a flower or the basket. But for this one, even though we perform the transeptal under the TEE, you can still find that um, the right lower wing is pretty difficult to get, to get the good alignment. For, the, for this, is there any point? No, okay. So for the left lower one, you can see that the alignment of um, um, the basket is not that good. So we, for this one, actually we did more abrasion. We try to make more rotation. So according to the protocol, usually you perform two um, basket in one shape and then uh, two abrasion in another basket shape. 
but for this one, because we know that um, the right lower and the um, and the, especially the inferior region, uh, the contact may not be good. So we need to rotate and rotate again, and to ensure it has a contact in different segments. And actually, uh, in the era presentation this year, they advocate that for the right lower wing, especially in this situation, you should you know inject the contrast. You should um, inject the contrast uh, to ensure the contact. So for PFA, you don't need any force, but you have to ensure the good contact. So um, for right lowering, actually, uh, you can try to you know confirm the contact by shooting the contrast, and you will see how good about the you know the distance between the ostium of the vein to the catheter. So again. Um, I hope you can see that uh, after the operation, the same thing. Can you, ah, okay. you see, the swelling is quite significant after the PFA. So before that is, again, it's just one millimeter. But after the PFA, uh, usually, uh, according to our experience, it's talking about six to seven millimeter. Pretty compatible with cryo. We did the same thing for the cryo operation, and we found that there is uh, there was a significant swelling after the operation. So um, again, we did the sizing before the operation. This time, we performed the LAO by other company, and let's see uh, if we will have the same issue. So um, this is the first attempt. Um, the problem for this is, um, let's look at the TE. The swelling definitely has some issue to the disc position. And you see uh, the device is uh, a little bit out of the left uh, atrial appendage. So, um, so to some case, I will say the swelling of um, the ridge will have uh, some effect over the LAO implantation. And that's uh, one of the considerations before uh, for, for you to take the F, uh, reference exercising. So we performed the second uh, deployment. This time we try to put the device deeper and hopefully by doing that we can avoid of, um, you know, the, the problem of the swelling. So again, um, this is the final result and I hope you can appreciate that actually the device is deeper and this time um, because it uh, is deeper, it don't uh, land on the area of a swelling. So the disc can appropriately cover the ostium. So that's some traits uh, and some problem when you consider the combined procedure with a PFA. So this is my last slide and I would like to show you some of uh, our experience. We have started the procedure since November last year. So far up till now, we did 26 cases. The average age is uh, 61.2 years old. Uh, most of them uh, have a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. We perform combined procedure for a patient. Uh, as uh, reported in most of the case series, the acute PV isolation rate is 100%. And the number of lesions per vein is around 8.7. So pretty compatible with uh, the reported series. And then the procedure time uh, usually is pretty fast. With the GA procedure, it's talking about 90 minutes only. And for the fluoroscopy time, uh, at the beginning it's a little bit longer, but now it's shorter and shorter. So um, the mean fluoroscopy time is uh, 16. And so far, we didn't encounter any esophageal lesion issue, PV stenosis, pericardial effusion, and surprisingly, uh, actually, all the patient didn't complain chest pain after the procedure. And I think it's pretty compatible with uh, all the case report. And so far, uh, because we have started the procedure since November last year, so we just have a couple of patients with a uh, three months data. And so far, uh, all of them with a uh, repeated ECG monitoring and some of them have a device, uh, I mean the pacemaker. So far, 100% of them still in the sinus rhythm. Uh, we might show that uh, five of them have a persistent atrial fibrillation before. So, uh, so far, I will say if you look at the far pulse uh, data, it's quite encouraging. And 
even in the long term follow up, um, they are talking about eighty something percent of a patient. I mean, in the successful rate. So I think our result is quite compatible with a European reported case series and. Later on, maybe in APHRS, hopefully we have a more data and more cases and we can share with you about the latest um, update in our center. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gary, for the nice case and also the um, good results. Congratulations. So um, now the topic is open for discussion. Any question from the floor or my panelists? Maybe ask uh, Gary, the absence of chest pain, can you uh, suggest a reason? Or is that because there's no pericardial injury? Um, I think there's mainly two reasons. One, uh, the first one is actually PFA is not a thermal energy. So it won't, I, we suspect it won't cause any pericarditis after the abrasion. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, as we all know, PFA is a tissue dependent. It won't cause any injury. To the nerve, and I think that's uh, one of the major reason why you didn't have some visceral pain after the PFA. Oh, Chen, may I ask you a question about post op management? So, comparing to cryo balloon ablation, do you have any difference in uh, post op management, say for low cheva score in terms of any correlation? Uh, so far, for post uh, operation protocol, we adopt the same. Uh, just like the quiet one. The reason for that is uh, PFA is different energy, uh, but uh, the nature of atrial fibrillation probably will be the same. So it really depends on the Chevrolet score and we will consider the anticoagulation according to the uh, um, the Chevrolet score. But of course, we uh, in our center, because uh, we um, we try to advocate the combined procedure in most of our patients. So the anticoagulation definitely will be changed according to, you know, if the patient undergo, underwent the uh, combined or not procedure. For antiarrhythmic, uh, for paroxysmal, now we tend to stop the antiarrhythmic because um, we suspect that actually the patient didn't have any pericarditis after the uh, PFA. I, I don't have any proof, but according to most of the case series, it seems that's the case. So, but for persistent, uh, we will um, prescribe uh, three months antiarrhythmic. And then if the patient's still in sinus rhythm, we will stop. This concludes the PFA Summit 2023, endorsed by ESC, with special closing remarks from the president of EHRA of ESC, Professor Jose Marino. Thank you for, for this uh, very nice uh, symposium. It was uh, really thrilling to uh, see uh, this uh, technology, how it's evolving. So very nice cases, very nice presentation. So congratulations for this uh, nice initiative. So I give the word now to uh, Dr. Lam for if he wants to say something. In today's conference, we have seen the scientific theory, clinical evidence an early practice of PFA technology in Europe and Hong Kong. PFA technology has a shorter procedural time compared to other ablation methods, which can help reduce patients' pain during the procedure. Additionally, PFA has demonstrated similar efficacy to other ablation methods and may reduce the chance of disease recurrence. This conference has provided attendees with a deeper understanding of the new technology, pulsed field ablation, introduced in Hong Kong, and we believe that this new technology will be more widely used in the future.